buttons here that make me have sound and people hear us and say hi that I know that I forgot something and I didn't break it. Hi. But welcome, everybody. Discussing Tabletop. It is November 9th, 2024. Hey, we've uh, we're reached the... We're getting deep into November. Um, I guess there's... Yeah, the this is still the beginning of November. I mean, I know, two out of five weeks. In. Yeah, oh, two and a... Four and a half. It's a new November. You know. Um, I mean, like, uh, I haven't cemented my plans for um, Pax Unplugged at all yet, and that's only a month away, so I really have to, like, sit down and figure out what I'm doing for that. Uh, I only might want to go one day on the entire thing. Like, I've decided things. not to go. I was I mean, actually like, planning on going, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> I was actually planning on going at the beginning of the year. Um... Uh, but, you know, between um, breaking a tooth and moving, um, yeah, money and time are gone. You see, that's, I think, understandable. Like, it's been a kind of, I feel like, I can't call it crazy. There's been a lot of stuff that's happened this year that I feel like there was a lot of discussion about more people coming and seeing more people. But I think it's just the numbers aren't there as much as it was before. So I just have to kind of figure out. At this point, I'll probably go down a day. Anybody that I know that I'm still going to kind of hang out with <coughs> and figure out. Check out what's kind of there on a general basis. See some things, you know. Um, get a good idea of some of the big products and stuff like that. Do my best to do a little bit of the job I kind of go there for. But I'm going to make it. I, I think I've always talked about it in the past. You know, I, I would like... As much as it's not bad to go there for that, that's, you know, I'm only going down there and going, it, it's, I'm, I'm taking time to travel there and all that stuff. It's, it's a, it's a stress. Yeah, it's um, a lot. It'd be more for me because I'd have to fly, but. I, I mean, like, it's the thing of, like, if I had a lot more people there that could help with and, you know, or, like, mm -hmm. was staying in the area rather than, you know, yes, it's much cheaper yeah. to go, you know, by train in, but it's. Yeah. Maybe next year I will have time and money. Hey, you know, uh, one of these years it'll be a really nice one for a good pass. Mm -hmm. That's all I can say. Uh, one of these years. So, um, shall we dive into what's going on in our tabletop news of the week and kind of start us out with that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, our first topic today is some issues that have been going on with the Secret Layer Marvel. Uh, hey, we heard about it coming up, and uh, first off, there was major technical issues that started coming in. Um, I have two articles related to it. The first one is on the um, first issues, but then also, like, apparently... Uh, there was a lot of drama related to the thing. Um, like, the, okay, so the order of queue on the fourth when it went live was paused for six minutes into the process due to technical problems. It stayed down for several minutes, then was reopened for expected customers, seeing an extended expected time to get an on uh, ordering screen of over an hour. So that took two to three hours for several customers that got in line at exactly 9 a.m. EST to process their order. Um, and by 11.26, uh, so only two and a half hours in, the Arcane Signet promo card was sold out. Um, uh, do you have a link? Yeah, I'll link both of these. Yeah. So I'll link the original one that was from the fourth. Uh, so this is the first uh, article. Um, and link also the other one that was after it. It's one of those things as we've seen some issues with the uh, Secret Layer Q and stuff like that, but... Yeah. We haven't heard about it in a while because it was kind of that thing of like, oh, hey, hadn't you solved a lot of these issues that we've had early on? <laughs> you know, or or since you've kind of switched to this, like, everybody has to get in to get it problem, hadn't you kind of solved these issues? No, you still have them, you know? Ah, uh, hey, you know, when you don't have that uh, print on, when you have limited orders, it turns out, like, issues like this just... Well, and everyone, yeah, I mean... There's also the point, it's like, you can have limited orders, but why not just make enough so that way people can actually, you know, you know, if you if you have 
yeah. you know, like ten times what they're providing, then everyone, then mostly everyone can like have a share, and only those who like come in like you know a week late uh, might have some issues, you know. I feel like sometimes they don't sell out some of these secret layers, but they're the ones that are like you know not very expensive, you know, they're a little bit more unusual art or something like that that aren't going to be for everyone. They still sell out. So you can judge, like, oh, these Marvel ones, we should have, like, four or five times the amount ready so we don't have to, like, have these sell-out uh, things right away. Um, so, yeah, yeah so people that got... Because it basically, all it does, and this is the problem, is, like, their secondary market is very important, but when you're, you, you give rise to scalpers in a secondary market... Like, that's the thing, is if people want one of these cards, you, you get, like, people who will scout, because why not? Uh, there's a limited amount. How many can I get? I'm going to get as many as I can, and then, you know, sell, resell them, because it's a popular one. People are going to want it. People will pay for it. So, um, I do like what they say in the article here. Uh, for further information on this is, so, the tra this train wreck, continued after all this. So, the, again, the first article is talking about the first, like, down, which was, like, the big thing that was, like, there. But, um, so now we'd have people that got in line at 9 o'clock that aren't getting the promo. Uh, and then you've got people that they're, uh, they can't get into their wizard account. It's down that way. Uh, people that they're, when they get into their ordering screen, their cart's empty. People that wait for five or six hours and it says the drop has sold out. When they were waiting in there for five or six hours. Um, and I do like how there was a comment on Twitter slash X from someone that was... Uh, the the information is that those cards from some of these drops are already over $100 on the secondary market. Yep, that's what I was talking has, about with scalpers. Their price has jumped up significantly. Yep. Into an insane degree. And I'm sorry, those cards were cool... They weren't a hundred dollars cool. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. the kind of thing I'm like. I'm like, yeah, I would never spend that much on this, but yet it's there are people that probably will because they really, really wanted them, and these are the big things that they love, and it's they're being taken advantage of. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, that's the thing. It is these kind of limited effects. And especially when it's done so poorly, Dor, like, people who get there first, you know, get checked out last because your system sucks. Yep. And this is definitely one of those things. It's like, you, you, I think it's the thing that as much as people have, you can talk about, like, and it's, I, I, I can, hi, Momo. Uh, I, I'm not, like, the biggest, um person on the entire idea of, like, getting a, um, exhaust, what is it, is that, it's not exhaustion, the, the Marvel, Marvel TV. I think it's just a different kind, it's, it's not like you're tired of the superhero stuff necessarily, you're tired of the way that they're presenting it a lot of ways, and maybe that there's too much stuff to watch, all these kind of things. It, it is a fatigue, it's just, like, different than, like, you think it would be. People still love Marvel in a lot of ways, and superhero stuff. They're just like, eh, you know, maybe I'll watch that later on on TV or something. Or, you know, maybe I'll watch it on one of my streaming services. Like, oh, I got just Disney Plus and I'll watch it on there or something like that later on. Things like that, that, you know, you don't maybe get that same in the theaters push at you got anymore. Okay, great. But, yeah, it's very popular. And I'm sorry, the magic community is a very, like, ingrained nerd community. I can't, I can definitely see why... They would really want the Marvel cards. It's also it's also the the fact that they're putting unique cards out. If someone all, really agree. wants a, something in their deck, like oh my yeah. gosh, this will make me able to win tournaments in this way, you know, like or even just you know I can yeah. meet my friend finally, <laughs> um, you know, whatever. It's like okay, this is a unique card, and you know we talked about how they're not putting out like reprinting card mechanics like at all <laughs> um like they're taking months or years to even start considering reprinting a concept um that yeah. they have in these exclusive things that it's like okay well i need this and it, and then 
And then people basically go like, okay, well, like, so it actually, and they say it in this article, um, actually, I just saw this, uh, Wizards of the Coast exasperates fans forever by giving the Mar uh, Marvel hero magic cards in, the, in these sets unique mechanics that fans can't find anywhere else, but the, but then also limiting the availability, uh, quant, uh, quant, uh, the available quantity uh, of yeah. these get game pieces to enhance FOMO. And I, I feel like there is a difference between enhancing FOMO and tormenting your fans. You know, and that, they've, I mean, they've overgone their line there. You know. I mean, I don't FOMO think just means every, FOMO, I don't, I don't like think, at all. I, I, I just think, uh, personally, I do not think you should make FOMO your market, uh, uh, your market, uh, your selling point. <laughs> you know, like. Yeah. Like, that's the thing. Like, you should not, in, in a, like, there's one thing for, like, you know, a, something that's actually, like, limited, like, you know, a artist doing a concert. Like, yeah. I mean, there's problems with that. We actually talked about that on the show. But, um, uh, <laughs> with some Monopoly issues going on there. But, um, but, um, sorry, I can turn down the volume. I'm speech jamming myself a bit. I listened to this thing on playback yeah. anyway um, uh where was i uh but yeah like there's actual things with actual actually limited abil availability like an artist can only do so many shows you know if they're like performing but this is literally how many pieces of cardboard you print <laughs> exclusivity is not necessarily a bad and exclusivity can create fomo it's just that you artificially creating that exclusivity and that FOMO can result in a lot of problems and honestly speaking just is more of a headache for your fan base and makes it honestly be very unhappy with you. And having an unhappy fan base doesn't help the health of your game. I mean, let's let's be real. If if one because I don't know what card it was, but I, I feel like one of these cards is probably good. Uh probably a pretty good card. Um There was a few in there that I saw that I think would be good for certain types of games. I don't think any of them were yeah. like the big all end all game breaker, but there were definitely mm -hmm. some that were like, oh, that would be a very good piece in this deck in this format or this deck yeah. in this format. And because they're legal in all formats now, yeah, yeah. it means and that so it's opened you... up the door for that a lot more. Yeah, and so if you like do anything, like if you're someone who you need this car, it's like, it's basically kind of this point where if you need this card for your deck to work the way you want it to, um, and then suddenly you can't get it without spending hundreds of dollars, uh, you know, it, it's like you're literally just alienating your, um, like, lower-end players, basically being like, sorry, but um, unless you're willing to pay a hundred bucks on the secondary market, not even to us, um, for this card, then um, you can't yeah. play this game. Is basically it's... what they're doing. It's one of the reasons that they started doing those premium modern sets was to redo, to make modern more viable to more people because modern was a very expensive format. There was like certain cards in there that were just exorbitantly priced that made modern decks. Um, they have now technically reduced those prices and made modern much more accessible. It's still a more expensive format. I'm not going to deny that. But it is less expensive than it was. Similarly speaking, like, you know, it, it's... The reprints make formats more acceptable. Um, I, here, here, here's another thing. Uh, oh, no. Uh, so Sony made enough PS Pros to basically kill scalping. That Wizards can't print more cardboard uh, to stop their rampant issues. That is actually really true, that the, the scalpers lost money on the PS5 Pros. Um, either because they're not selling them enough, or honestly, they had enough support. Well... It, but the thing is, is there's always limited supply for consoles when they first come out because they can only make them so fast. Yeah. Um, and, like, a lot of people do try and get ahead of that by buying them up and reselling them. But, uh, yeah, no, so if they actually did a good job making production fast enough to where they couldn't scalp. <laughs> and the thing is, uh, you, you, a PS, because of something like PS5 Pro, and in this case, I would call it, like, it's a reprint. But it's a reprint of something that people have had a possibility of getting. So, yes, there's some people that might want to upgrade for various reasons. You know, uh, there's people that still get the system that might want to get the newer one. So there is a 
place for it. And I think that's a kind of a similar comparison here. These are reprints that, yeah, people could have had gotten in the past, but you want it to be accessible still because it's a removing the fact that you know maybe you had problems with supply. It was limited. To, it, it, it's a mess. It's a mess. I, I there's so much complaints I have about this. And, you know, this is just spurning this entire thing on even more. Honestly, that, the more I'm we talk about the more we talk about magic, the more I'm happy I never got into it. I considered it a long time ago, but I'm now glad I did. It's one of those things is, like, I want to still be into magic, but a lot of the stuff they've been doing lately has made me... It's reminding me of the why, for a time period, I got out of magic. Um, yeah. There was a lot of things that happened in an, in an order that basically soured me to a lot of um, things. Um, you know, so... You chose the more expensive hobby, hobby than mine. Sorry. <laughs> Um, anyway. <laughs> yeah. We should, we should continue on. Um, just keep in mind, it's, it's a mess over there, and, you know, try to get your secret layers as you can, if you want them, or, mm -hmm. And, uh, if you want any of these cards, they're, like, $200 on the secondary market, and that's where you can get them now. I, they're not worth that. I'm sorry, <laughs> they're not worth that. <laughs> <clears throat> but so got an interesting TTRPG up on oh, sorry, Kickstarter. 100 plus. I read the wrong thing. <laughs> Let me switch this over here. Um, so Esper's uh, a fantasy opera tra uh, tabletop role playing game that is both a normal traditional tabletop game, but also apparently has deck building mechanics built into it. So this is kind of an interesting. I've always wanted something like okay. I've actually considered making this. Like, I'm, so, I've been so, like, I've loved, I've loved the idea of like deck building mm -hmm. games to a degree, and I've always thought it'd be interesting to do like an RPG with that. I'm very curious now about this. <laughs> okay, so you still use a combination of dice and cards to create narrative and gameplay. Um, so at the core, it's like any other RPG system. Um, so there's the GM, you know, your narrator, um, and each player creates their own espers characters in the game, um, and there's potential risks and dice rolls that are there. Um, it's also about playing cards. Um, I have to see the exact mechanics for playing cards, though. I'm trying to look up the big Um Yeah, so, you, so um, uh, combat begins, uh, and then uh, players place their characters on the battlefield. They draw five cards from the Fate deck. Um, okay. The players roll dexterity to for combat. Each round allows the player to perform two basic actions uh, and one combat action. Mm -hmm. uh, the basic actions include uh, like moving and using items, and combat actions are attacking and casting spells. Once okay. every participant has, has acted, the round ends. After each round, players draw one new card from their deck. Okay. Um, yeah, I, and using the cards is like... Oh, standard, you can use a standard 52 card poker deck, um, but they also have their own cards. That's pro that's a pretty good thing to use, like, you know, they have a way of deck, uh, deck building the standard deck, too. But, you know, your own cards there, too. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd be interested yeah, yeah. in the, the, the how you kind of move around the deck and stuff like that. Yeah, well, the deck um, is comprised of 20 cards drawn randomly, mm -hmm. um, which represents their availability, available actions. Um... I assume basically your character, your build, your items, and stuff like that. Maybe oh, interesting. Game. Okay, spades are dodge, clubs are attack, diamonds are magic, and hearts are skills. Okay. Um. You give the free quick start. Too. Yeah. So like, it's kind of neat. And then their number. Okay, so they basically. Okay, so it is just the standard card deck, but um, they just have their own like special. Got it. Because it's still one through four. So yeah, I assume you like have... Um, it's unclear if you... I mean, I assume it's random. Yeah, so you pick 20 random cards mm. when you start. And then um, from there you can go on. Um, from there you can build stuff. Well, well no, like like each, each combat you get 20 uh, random cards. And that's your deck. 
Mm. Um, the num the numbers mean things. Um, oh, the number is the bonus you add to the die roll for the action. Okay, mm -hmm. so you 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 roll. So it's kind of like D and D. Okay, so it sounds like it's kind of like D and D where you roll. But then, like, let's say you attack, you roll the dice. If you hit, you you play uh, a card, and you can like add that to it. I don't know if, what comes first. Playing, uh, let's see, adding cards. Players can earn powerful new cards as rewards for completing quests. Um. Okay, so you do you okay. do alter your deck. You, you do alter your deck. Each, okay. Each player would basically start with a fifty-two card deck, which which is your initial like fate deck, and then you kind of alter and change around things as you do uh, stuff. So I assume that's why it's like easier to have. One of their decks or something that has probably more options. I don't know. Well, no, no. Uh, okay, so so uh, you start. So basically, when you you start with a with twenty um, cards of a fifty-two card deck, and then you can okay. alter it from there. Okay, I so, see. So like you have things that like you would randomly choose the twenty cards, and then like abilities you have might alter that twenty card deck that you would have to uh, you know kind of moving cards around as you would need them. Um, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. It's a neat idea. I'm. I, I'm. Honest. I'm probably gonna back this. This is kind of a cool idea. <laughs> I would be curious to see how it worked in action. Yeah. Looks like the digital's fifteen twenty for the soft cover, um, and twenty five for. Can you talk about like? Yeah. So it's it's. It's an interesting idea. A lot of interesting ideas. They give a little bit of information about the world and characters, too. But I do think the, the, the system is what really stands out to me for, for, for a fantasy game to have something like as uh, interesting as the deck book. Mm -hmm. so, pretty cool. Alright, um. We could hang around a little longer, but I think we should check out some more stuff. And. Mm -hmm. I haven't talked a lot about Renegade Game Studios and their various uh, things. I think we've hit up on them occasionally. But, you know, uh, I did want to like at least shout out this uh, a Transformers book, which is Technic Organic, because it, it's basically Beast Wars. Um, they're basically, they're, they're bringing rules for like doing like, Beast Wars, which was a very, you know, if... If you're anybody that knows Transformers, Beast Wars, uh, computer-generated um, computer graphics uh, show was the kind of big secondary one that a lot of people really liked post the original Transformers run. Um, so bringing that in, pretty cool. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Um, it's one of those things that's like you see like, because it's like what, it's um, G.I. Joe, My Little Pony, Power Rangers, and Transformers, and... I feel like the rest of them, you can have a lot of stuff, but like, I mean, what, Power Rangers, it's more Power Rangers series, it's, they've got a billion series now, you know, more the Sentai stuff. But I, don't, I don't know if they're doing a lot of stuff with My Little Pony, that you can kind of expand upon that. G.I. Joe, I guess there's, I'm assuming beyond the, I, the TV series, I, there maybe there was I feel like comics. just the con, yeah, there was, but I feel like just the idea of G.I. Joe's getting a little bit out of, uh, you know, a little bit out of date. I don't know about that. But. I think it's the thing that, like, because there has been a lot, I feel like in comparison to those three, there has been a lot more, well, I can't say there's been more than Power Rangers. There's been more Transformers that have taken different directions. Power Rangers yeah. is still Power Rangers kind of thing, you know. Yes, the stories are different, dude, like, but a lot of them are very similar, you know, in a lot of ways. Um, so, you know, it's, they transform into suits, fight some things, giant monster, get a big robot, you know, fight it. That, that repeats basically in all the series, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um, I think it's just, yeah, because I don't know, I think there's just, like, with G.A. Joe, part of me is like, is that still, like, a thing? Because I feel like there's a little bit about the, like, <laughs> I don't know. So the idea of this is you could keep something, like, very Gen 1 and be Dinobots, or you could do, like, Beast Wars and do, like, Max and Rules with rules from this. Uh, so I think it's pretty cool. Um, mm. Again, is it... It's pre-ordered right now. But nonetheless, um, it, seeing that there, this was... A, I think that's a really cool thing for them to add in to uh, in, increase it, you know? Um, yeah. So, 
cool direction for the for the transformer team. Yeah. Transformers had more storylines and more directions. G.I. Joe was just still an advertisement for toys. Yeah. That's, uh, that's what I was thinking yeah. at. We're just like, is that really like yeah. <laughs> like who is that a thing? Like, get it, but <laughs> it's like, do people actually? Because like I remember GI Joe, but I also don't remember GI Joe. <laughs> you know, it's like I remember it existed, but I don't remember it. <laughs> Was it early '90s? Maybe repeats of GI Joe episodes on his USA Network. Um, I remember that. I think it was USA. Uh, it was like one of those weird like. Cable channel networks was still showing it back in the early 90s and stuff like that. In the mid -90s. I think there was also like the, you had a lot of the repeats of the Ninja Turtles, the original one, like the real Ghostbusters and stuff like that. Um, so I did see plenty of G.I. Joe, but I could not remember a lot of it for the life of it because it was just like simple action advertisement. I don't think it was the worst advertisement the... series. Was they they on Heroescape? <laughs> Sorry, that was a... Is that still a thing? Sorry. Uh, I'm I can't answer that. Uh, I loved, that... I own like 90% or like, no, not, much, not that much. Like 80% of the Heroescape stuff. Um, but honestly, I didn't know it. Yeah, this must be oh pre-order. Oh, are they bringing it back? Is that what's happening? Sorry, I just got off. I just saw that they had Heroescape at the top, and I'm like, I'd love that. Um, I haven't heard a lot back? about it, but they could have brought it back. It's been back, I think. Yeah. Wow. Jeez, I miss this so much. I love playing Heroescape. Anyway, I mean, I think, I'm going to have to look into this. <laughs> Renegade's done some good things, too put some interesting directions. Uh, I because think... basically so someone owned it, I don't remember who. Um yeah. then uh then Wizards bought it, killed it, and I haven't heard much from it since. <laughs> yep. Look. Um it's always interesting to see where the where Wizards has had their hand. Because they really mm -hmm. have had their hand in a lot of surprising stuff sometimes. Like Yeah, that was actually like one of the first things I heard about what's interesting though is it doesn't seem like they sell any of the older stuff so they may actually just be like they may have gotten the license in or make but not for making new stuff but not their old stuff what what was it um uh i i i was i i i, I got back to my old like uh history of ccgs talking about the like, early ccgs and stuff like that and the video i just did it was interesting to know that uh steve jackson games made a CCG back in the early days. Yeah, um, Steve Jackson con uh, con confessed that during those early days, Wizards gave them a loan to do that. Huh. <laughs> yeah. That's, like, part of, like, the entire history. It's like, yeah, yeah, Wizards gave us some money to help, you know, put together our CCG back in the early days. Like, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, it was uh, kind of interesting. Because they actually... so many things. So many things. Yeah. Yeah, it was actually, Heroescape was actually interesting. Like, the plot of it was basically, um, it was very much uh, League of Legends, where it's like, oh, people and things taken from across the universes uh, drawn together to solve, like, battles for gods, <laughs> basically. Um, the idea was, like, you were in Valhalla trying, like, solving problems for, like, solving a problem. I forget, like, all the details. They had, like, a lot of lore and stuff. Like, whoever originally made it. It's like put a lot of lore into it. It was kind of neat. Um, to the point where like one character had like three different versions depending on like where in the plot line he was. Hmm. Anyway, sorry. This is just a nostalgia trip for me. I love Heroescape. I need to go and get, <laughs> get my box it's, of Heroescape. It's acceptable. We we have distractions. Along. <laughs> um, I just saw the label at the top and my brain like exploded. <laughs> So we can talk uh, briefly about Powder and Brimstone. Now, this is the old Kickstarter for it, um, which is having it delivered kind of stuff soon. Uh, but we found out that the official release beyond the Kickstarter release is going to be done by Free League Publishing. Um, so they are going to be putting it out on March 18th, 2020. Uh, 
It must be 2023. Uh, my information has a typo because it says March 18th, 2024. Will hit retail in that. So I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be 2025. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, yeah. if there's a typo there, then my information. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so this is, this is a thing that some people did that was compatible with more core. We talked about the Ward series of games last week when we talked about the uh, more org office version of it. Yep. Um, but it's basically trying to survive a desperate situation and trying to make a, pop, uh, a, a profit. And it's basically, you know, gunplay and witchcraft kind of adventure. Um, fun combo. So, yeah. Uh, we may or may not have talked about this when originally was up on uh, Kickstarter. I can't tell you for sure. Um, but yeah, so we now know that uh, other than the fact that, uh, again, the Kickstarter stuff is going to be, you know, officially coming out to those that backed it relatively soon. And we know now when a that they're getting more of a release after, you know, which is always good to see for Kickstarters to see them have uh, further support. And you know, Free League uh, being a not only creator but publisher for a lot of stuff, similar to Modifius, good to see them uh, come over. So if you had a pack the Kickstarter and you're looking into something, especially if you're a fan of more board, um, this might be a, a adaptation you might be interested in, and there will be opportunities. Uh, I might give it a shout-out when it officially comes out, just to be really good and maybe find it this out. Yes. Um, can I have a site for this? I'm just going to check something out. I don't think I'm going to check something out. No. Anyway, one, more um, thing about, one more thing about HeroScape while I'm thinking about it. Um, they actually are great. Like, I like them a lot because they actually make great D&D minis as well. Because they're, they're just those little pre-painted minis. Huh. And, yeah, they use pre-painted minis for their stuff. And they have a lot of them. Um, so. Okay. Well, I'll link to Catalyst here. Um, we got some news from Catalyst Games, which is so weird because it's so hard for me to ever find goddamn news from Catalyst Games. I try so much to pay attention to stuff for, like, Shadow and Battletech, which are neat systems, you know? But, like, I have to look through some, some more third party sources. So, we got some more Shadow and 6th Edition products. I'm glad they're keeping the line. Similarly speaking, we're getting more Battletech stuff. Um, there's a new campaign book for Battletech that's going to be Hot Spots. Uh, Hinterlands that's going to go up into retail on November 27th um, where it's an area of some hot combat zones so it's very battle things mercenaries wise. The Shadowrun book is going to be Tarnished Star also on November 27th which is dealing with law enforcement and security in the Sixth World which I'm not going to lie is good information to have. Honestly <laughs> Okay, yeah, this is a thing where it's all like, I'm actually surprised they don't have something like this already, since the whole point of Shadowrun is avoiding the law. You need to know what happens when you run into the law. <laughs> or if it's also security. It's security for the places you're breaking into. I mean, I think we yeah, get that's sort a... of basic things about this overall, but like, yes, having an actual book on it, I'm like, yeah, this is like, this is actually really helpful. Like, I can also know that back in, um, back in September, they released a book too, which I totally missed. Uh, Smooth Operations, um, which let's see here. It's basically was a, a, a social book. I guess that's fine. That's not too bad. That that one does have help, but it's sort of like just finding out when Catalyst releases this stuff. It's like it, it, it really is pulling teeth. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's it's goddamn pulling teeth. I mean, it doesn't get help. Information. The last update on their website was apparently August 13th. Yes, and like. <laughs> It's like, I, I've been paying attention to Catalyst for a while, and also they have, like, a Shadowrun site. The Shadowrun site stopped updating, like, for, like, three years, and I gave up on it. You know? That's why I, yeah. I stopped checking it. So it's sort of like, I, it's just so bad. I think put it up on their Twitter slash. Let me check that. Let me check that. 
Um, no. You don't update anything there either. I so guess really they have... A, you're a media, media manager. <laughs> I, like, that's the thing is, are, is it, I'm, so, I'm assuming it's either they're sending stuff, information directly out to news sites, or they have, like, maybe you can sign up for, like, a newsletter. But other than that, I'm like, I don't know. I, I don't know where to get the information for this. And I, I would love to see when they're releasing some of these things, but... Yeah. Oh, oh, wait. They do seem to actually post regularly on their Facebook. <laughs> yeah. I guess often maybe their Discord too. Oh, do they have a Discord? Yeah, they've got a link on their Facebook. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I don't want to log into my account. I don't even remember what my account is. <laughs> I, I refuse to log into my Facebook right now, even though I'm cool with using it. It remembers my stuff. So. <laughs> I'm like, I refuse. What's funny refuse. is like it gives, me, it gives me this thing that I'm like, I, I don't even remember, like... I'm like, that is not a thing I own. <laughs> like, that is not a uh, <laughs> email address that I own. It's like uh, something at Facebook.com. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. I do have a password, though, apparently. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Um, I'm glad to see more stuff on those systems as much as, like, I complain about stuff, especially with 6th Edition Shadowrun and Shadowrun General. I do really love the world they built. And I also do really like the setting and stuff for battle tech. I don't I haven't done a lot of battle tech earlier. I've done a lot more shadowrun. But I always thought like the mech warrior slash battle tech kind of lines and stuff were really cool for the classic Western style giant robots. As much as like we get the versions of stuff like that in the East a lot more nowadays with, you know, Gundam and a lot of the uh, influence that has had. And certainly speaking, I can't deny that probably there's a little bit of influence in things like battle tech. It's probably not as heavy as you know, what we have now in a lot of time when it comes to mech-based stuff. So, it's a, it's a different spin in a lot of ways, and I'm, I'm glad to still have it. Um, anyway, we've got one final main topic today, and that's one I'm going to leave it to you, Worm, to talk about, since it's the one you brought to Okay. Us. So, uh... Let me uh, find it. Well, I'll just open it from your link. That's probably easier. I did so just... <laughs> Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, Make it easy. Actually, yeah. So, um, I ran into this more because dragons, but I decided to share it because it's kind of got an interesting concept in that it's meant to be like a 5e add-on that basically is a like non-combat or almost no combat system. Like, yeah. which I'm curious how this will work. Like, they explained parts of it. Um, but I think there's probably more to it than that. Um, cause they talked about like, um, but yeah, it's like the idea is like, there's this, it's more of an objective system, like where it's like, you need to complete objectives. Mm -hmm. Um, it's ba so, and it just basically heavily discourages combat. I think it's cool that they're, they put in a system, uh, for non-combat. Um, but yeah, also the art is wonderful. I do want to point out, like, honestly, just look at the art. It's great. It's very I nice. I love it. It de yeah. definitely is. Apparently, um, uh, they say at the bottom that apparently, like, this is work. The art is from a, like, super famous artist in France. <laughs> Not super famous. De moderately famous. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. So, um, but it's a really good art. Um, yeah, so, um... They offer a bunch of classes and stuff that kind of help with the non-combat focus, or sorry, subclasses. And then they also do um, a few new classes, which are more focused around non-combat as well. <laughs> um, and they add non-combat spells and stuff. So it's kind of interesting the way they set. They're, they're, I'm curious how it would work with existing D&D, since D&D itself is very combat focused. Um, yes, that is a very good idea. Like, as soon as you say that, I'm like, yes, you're right. It very much so <laughs> is. Uh, like, I feel like without having combat, you do lose a lot of ability to certain classes. Rogues become probably one of the best class when you get rid of combat. True. 
getting Rogue's a bunch of extra probably can still do a lot of things. The extra skills, the more... And I guess spellcasters as well, who can do a lot of utility. Yeah, but like... I guess but like, like fighter, fighter, there. paladin, barbarian. But, yeah. Ranger could probably still do some stuff. Generally. Not the new ranger who's focused around their uh, hunter's mark. Look, I'm, giving, I'm trying to give Ranger a bone here. <laughs> Poor Ranger's off in the corner. He's like, you know, you can go play with some animals. You know, and he's like, okay, I'll, yeah. I'll go play with some animals. Thanks, thanks. I guess if you want with the animal sub subclass, it could be nice. But yeah, um... So the whole... you, want me to, you want me to track something, guys? I can track something. <laughs> really good tracking. Actually that, actually, that would be very good for this, because uh, the example adventure they have is going to be about more about, like, cattle, like, finding and cataloging dragons, so, like, um, so actually tracking would be very helpful. Um, yeah, so the idea is that, like, you're in some place and you're trying, like, the, they, and that's not going to be, so the, they have the, like, the actual mechanical section and the additions they have, and then they have a second book, which is, like, an adventure. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I backed it, um, but I think it's very interesting because I, I, I want to see I want to see what mechanics they had to make like combat less appealing in Five E because like the point of Five E is to fight. <laughs> um, yeah, find it, yeah, it is like it's dungeons and dragons. You're meant to go into dungeons and fight dragons. <laughs> it, it's it's evolved in such a way that it's this very story-based system in a lot of ways, and definitely role-playing is much more a factor than combat nowadays. Yes, but it, combat is still an intricate part of it that you can't really remove because that's where it, 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 the encounter and the combat side of things drives most things, you know. Um, yeah. And, it, and I think it's the thing of it's not you can't have skills or or, 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 or encounters or challenges oh. it's that we, we talk we're, we talk a lot about encounters and challenges and i think that's the thing that is we don't have combat it kind of should be boring <laughs> yeah um i mean you have to it's a lot more role play and a lot more um you know it's a lot more role play basically um yeah you know a lot less tactics um also actually they did mention uh one of their classes the the classes they introduced the guide is basically it's, it's like, oh, it's a ranger with less focus on fight. It's like, okay. <laughs> so, yep, ranger gets kicked out right away. Uh, they don't even have, like, a fighter variant. They just say, nope, to the ranger. <laughs> Hi, guys. Uh, um, can I fight anything? It's really what I'm good at. I'm, I'm, I'm a good hunter. You know? No. Oh, no. I'll just stay here. Yeah. To be fair, um, if you knew you were going into a more passive, a more um, peaceful setting, and then you picked a fighter, uh, you're a dumbass anyway. <laughs> yes, that that is true. Fighters uh... have nothing good but fighting about them. Barbarians even have more than fighting <laughs> uh, than fighters do generally. Yeah, I think they get a couple of abilities that are kind of like outside that fighting purview. So. Mm -hmm. Depending uh, on the yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I just found the concept interesting. I'm. It has dragons and it's got an interesting mechanical concept, so I'm backing it. That's actually, by the way, the things I look for the most is um, in like an art, a new RPG is interesting take on a mechanic that's either not addressed or not well um, brought out. I'm sorry, Momo's comment is actually so true. He really, his favorite enemy just is racism. <laughs> class, <laughs> class ability. Really, got canceled for having racism <laughs> in his class feature. That's good. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I guess that, that really is what favorite enemy is. Oh my. Especially that's... since if you pick humanoid, you have to pick a specific subset like orc. <laughs> you really. Yup. Mm -hmm. wow. Uh, that's good. That's good. All right, cool. Um, anything else to add in though today for our amazing uh, 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 uh Kickstarter review for Dresden's today? Uh, I mean, another thing I can think of. I mean, the whole thing, part of the peaceful thing is around a thing system called locks and keys, where it's like you have to discover what the locks are, and then you have to figure out what the keys, and then you have to figure out how to basically um. 
it's it's a basically a more plot progression system where it's all like oh um this dragon is you know uh if you feed this dragon it'll like like it, basically for the gm it's like oh if you feed this uh, let me find the thing um mm -hmm. if uh it acts kindly towards people to feed it uh uh, boo, uh you know basically uh Um, oh yeah, like, and then it'll like say like meal. So basically, it's motivation, and then you give like a few options for like how to get that motivation or the locks, and then you as players have to figure out the keys, which are um, yeah. So it's a very very objective based system um, to overcome the locks. Yeah, so that's basically how the peaceful part works. Um, I think there's might be more to it than that, but that's what they describe here. It's, it's kind of like one of those things that we have a general idea of how it runs, but we have to see it more and do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they apparently do provide stats for the dragons uh, for more traditional D&D as well, which is cool. Okay. So if you just want the dragons, you can have uh, more stats. Cool. Yep. Hi. Um, we have a deeper discussion topic here. And I thought about this one because this is something that I'm going to be facing with the adventure I'm going to be running in 2E. My replacement Wednesday game uh, that I've been building. And it's keeping a lighter mood in a darker game. What I mean is that um, a story with very darker overtones. I don't mean like darker setting. I mean like, you know, which you can do with darker setting too. But if you're doing a horror setting, keeping the light mood, mood lighter without, you know, ruining it and kind of things like that. And I think that's a challenge that we all have as people that run in storytelling. Uh, I support how you experiences. Do you want to pop in, Momo, for the for this part here, or do you just want to, like, uh, you know, uh, leave it? Let me know. Um, so, I think it's the... Hello. Okay. Yep. Hi. There is. Hello. I mean, a lighter stream. mood and darker games is our theme. Yeah. Hi. I play this thing called Warhammer, which is exactly <laughs> that. <laughs> That's fair. You know, that's a good Yeah, point. yeah, that's true. Uh, it's a grim dark universe and um, you know, one of the, the depending yeah, the, depending on what you're running, I will use grim dark cuz truly nothing gets more bleak than a grim dark universe. That's that's the whole point, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um the best the best kind of grim dark which I'm going to use 40k as an example is where it's so horrifically bleak, you look at it and are just like, man, that is kind of stupid. Mm. And it makes <laughs> it a little bit funnier. Um, but Warhammer has a lot of that. Where it's like, oh, sure. Um, you know, these green-skinned orc dudes, you know, they're, they're really good at slaughtering people. And that's what they love to do. They love killing and, and eating people but they're very silly and they're yeah. just like football hooligans it, i think that's an interesting thing for it too it's sort of like keeping out it, so like I, I i can talk a little bit about the the one setting of my I'm favorite going to go to. orc one of my favorite but, orc names by the way is the like orcs would be very good at the stock market <laughs> they would because they they really would yeah. <laughs> they they could, would Cycle like, influence mean, the outcome into what it was shit is what they well, are funny. It's more just that they like what they believe they, they understand just yeah. how belief alters the system. Or, <laughs> uh, just like yeah, an old side tangent. Or, orcs are my favorite thing in Warhammer because they do have this whole if enough of them believe in something, it just happens. Uh there are cases where the Imperium will find orc vehicles and open up the like engine and it's just a, a rock that says room on it. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, what are you gonna say, Tantus? I was gonna say, um, I think that's the thing that, like, I want to not have. Like, I, I think it's sort of like the Crimson Queen started out at a very serious point, and it kind of stuck a lot with that kind of general serious tone. And I don't necessarily want to get rid of that because the setting for the next game that I'm planning on running, uh, the first one is that, uh, is going to generally be very serious, but it doesn't have that first overtone. It's basically... It's a version of it's the end of the world, and you're still fighting against that, 
but you're probably going to fail, kind of thing. You're in that situation. Um, uh, without getting into a lot of details, which I'll kind of mm-hmm. have to talk about. But shit's happening. Uh, your characters are helping the final fight against that shit. And will it be successful? Like, one in a billion chance, but at least you're trying. Hey, good for you. <laughs> Uh, so it's it's interesting because then it's like where do you keep up in like you, you, as you talked about orcs are a very good levity for the grim bar of yeah, orcs. Or, orcs are probably the most extreme example of hey this setting is really dark but here's these funny little silly guys yeah there are there are more subtle things if you just look well, if one of the the main factions is called is the sisters of battle people know them they're very dark because they're like the militant arm of the ecclesiarchy and the church so they're very much like you're a heretic we're gonna kill you and then everyone who's in your zip code because they might also be a heretic and we're not gonna investigate we're just gonna do it but if you look at their equipment and just how they are portrayed as just nuns in battle suits, that kind of lightens the mood a little bit into making it... It's a little bit silly, so you forget a little bit how dark it is. Yeah. It's sort of like, if... If the if you present, like... That's a good thing. Like If you present, like, a, 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 a thing that it is not, like, the absolute uh, death of everything, or the yeah. absolute, like, most horrible thing... Is it doing something really horrible, like, or is the outcome going to be very horrible? Mm. Sure, but maybe there's like it's it's there's like a little bit of almost like jovial like silliness. To this yeah, like the sisters will they, they will go into a, on a, like a planet or a city and they will just start purging anyone they think is a heretic. But they have their vehicles are covered in just like stained glass and church parts and candles everywhere, so it's a little bit like absurd. One of their tanks is just a it's a World War One style tank, but there's a pipe organ on the back of it, and that pipe organ fires missiles. And those missiles are fired because the person controlling it is playing a religious hymn on the organ. Uh <laughs> it is very silly. Oh <laughs> uh, and I think it's 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 the thing that like I think you need this kind of stuff, especially when it comes to TTRPGs, because darker RPGs are can be very overwhelming, even if you're getting people that are like, kind of know what they're coming for, because you do present over them the basic story, what's going on. It is, it is story, a, a oppressive when yeah. something is a little bit too dark and there's not a comedic undertone or any kind of uh, comedic relief to it. Yeah. So, yeah. you know. it. So, I wanted to bring up uh, two things. Um... First off, in Curse of Strahd, um, and I remembered this, they actually have a section basically saying input humor into this. Like, you want to make it dark, but make sure there's also humor to break mm-hmm. up the, the darkness. Yeah. Um, so there's like a whole, there's a whole, there's a small little section. It's like a, two paragraphs uh, about it. Um, but also, that also reminds me of something I remember learning in high school that um, in Greek, the whole thing of like tragedies and comedies were big in Greek, in Greece. Um, and when they did these plays, it'd be, um, I think the order was like two tragedies, a comedy, and then a tragedy was like the order they did them in or something like that. Um, to break up basically the, you know, oh, you have so many, it's like people can only handle so much tragedy. Yeah. They need something to break it up. There, there is actually a really good, um, literary science to that. Uh, comedy hits harder after a tragedy and tragedy hits even harder after a comedy. Yeah. Yeah. So so it actually is very important to incorporate that. So breaking it up is important. And in in incorporating that is difficult though. I mean yes. when you have a tone, it's hard to incorporate the it's, exact it's, opposite. It's a tone. balancing act because you could very easily have your darker game uh, turn into a little bit of the circus. And I think that's the thing too, is that Finding that balance is very hard. It's kind of one of those things is like, I've been looking, at, taking like a, a step back and kind of looking at Crimson Queen, which I've been doing it out now. I think there was like, not a, I don't think there was a lot to break the tone of. The tone wasn't necessarily super no. dark, but it was a very like, 
negative. It was, just, it was a very serious very, campaign. Very serious campaign, and I'm like, I but I let's... don't want to necessarily the most serious campaign, but it's like I know by concept is going to be very like at heart serious. So where can I not allow this to be Crimson Queen? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let, let's let's go a little yeah. further back. Skull and Shackle actually is kind of a very serious game. Mm -hmm. Because of how it starts out, you're literally slaves on a pirate ship. You sure. overthrow that guy, and then your whole quest is to kill that guy. And then other stuff happens, but they don't really connect that other stuff very well because it's Pathfinder. And I, I, after book four, it kind of falls apart a little bit. Yeah. Um, we made that game into an absolute clown show. Because yes. we all were a little bit too silly. I think that took maybe it a little far. We but we I, went full yeah. Pirates of the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Which, unfortunately, it's like, in some ways it worked, but I think there were definitely points in time where pushing it that far in the opposite direction was a little too much. It's sort of yeah. like, you need something in between, like, pirates and the way that it was presented, and, you know, um, it... I, maybe even went farther than pirates, because I feel like pirates has some points in time where it can be kind of serious, like especially the, the early ones. Problem um, with pirates as a concept and genre is uh, the absolute horrific nature of them has been entirely erased in in media. Yeah. Yes. I mean, piracy was. They're very whimsical time. and like, oh, they're the. The, the the cool adventurers on the scene. No, those people were horrific murderers and criminals. Yes, and uh, yeah, and basically um, the idea is the more horrible your crime, mm -hmm. or the more horrible you are, the faster people will surrender. Yep. So it's like if someone doesn't surrender, you want to be as horrible to them as possible, so that way next time when you run into someone, they don't sur they will surrender. I think that's where like. The original, literally like, how pirates were. The first Pirates of the Caribbean did a little better job of showing that. Kind yeah, of that was a little bit they, more serious of a movie, and, and then, they well, I mean, it's still a very silly movie, but it has a, a less silly tone to it than Two yeah. Onward. I mean, like when the, I, I I was thinking about it, like when the pirates like attack the city, they are doing a lot of horrible, yeah. deadly things, blowing up buildings and stuff, you know, stuff like that. Uh, for, for like that first attack and I think that kind of shows um, that maybe is the tone you really want in something we're closer to that that kind of like you could have some levity but you, well, you, I, it's a darker thing maybe that's the kind of direction I, you want to choose from. I honestly think I honestly think that um, that is actually a good the, the first Pirates of the Caribbean was actually a good example of mixing in humor into yeah. Uh, what is an otherwise a dark story? Absolutely. I mean, Jack yeah. Jack Black is very much the comic relief. Or, Jack, not Sparrow. Jack, <laughs> Jack Sparrow. Jack Sparrow. That movie be very say? different with Jack Black. <laughs> <laughs> be, I don't think it would be better. No, uh, it'd be more interesting. I might like it more. Uh, I was singing comedy, I think, and my brain went to be. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> One of the one of the problems with with darker series games is um, players often want to be the cool hero guy, mm -hmm. and it's a lot harder to be that cool hero guy in a game that's oppressively dark. Somebody yeah. who's played in oppressively dark tabletop games, I, I, I am generally someone who can do that because I spoilers. I play a lot of evil characters. I have a lot of experience that, so I'm fine with it. But I have people who who just would not be able to do a darker game because it's just too dark. It's not a whimsical tell where you're the cool yeah. hero guy. I yeah, darkness tends to add a lot of gray to heroism. Like it's it's you you know like you have to do something bad in order to achieve something yeah, good, like, which is very anti-hero. Like for uh, <laughs> Crimson Queen, I would argue for half that game. We leaned a little evil. Yeah. And then an angel yeah. showed up and was like, stop that. <laughs> Honestly, uh, I think we would have definitely, like, I'm, like, I I think we've gone been a lot less good without uh <laughs> Oh, it would have been Zardis. horrible. I think you would have become, like, fully, Absolutely. you would have still fallen for asthma, but you would have been full vampire. Um, 
there, there was a lot, a lot of more directions brutal. that game could have gone, and I think it's kind of this one of... It was... Unfortunately, I think just some issues with Crimson... The Curse of Crimson Throne that... World Adventure Path has problems. That I did not detect at the beginning. I think that's the problem with these very long adventure paths sometimes, is you can get a, you can kind of look through, get some summaries, get some ideas, but until you kind of dissect some of these chapters, it kind of can be hard to pick up on some subtleties in the way things change and the direction that it goes in. There were things that were curveballs for me when I kind of had an idea. I knew Scarwell was going to be a big dungeon, but how it was presented, like, I didn't dive into it very heavily until I got to it, and it's like, ah, what the fuck is this? You know, or like, the end Scarl is like... Scarl was a lot. Weird. You know, I kind of had some ideas for the end, but then like you uh, kind of look at it and you're like, oh, this is how this works. This is really weird. I you know, it, it's like... I say it all the time. These adventure paths fall apart around book five. Yeah, well, I can see that. Mm -hmm. I mean, apparently just Pathfinder 1 yes, itself... Yes, it falls really apart. falls apart after, after, like, like, after level like 13, it really... The balance just stops yeah. existing. Yeah, it, it becomes much harder to balance those higher levels. Turns take forever, uh, enemies have too yeah, much HP. Ba basically, yeah, and, it, and it's kind of like one of your players is basically useless the whole fight, yeah. depending on what you're fighting. If someone, like, <laughs> the fighter's just going to get taken out because they have a low will save, and then so what do yeah. they do? Yeah. Or, or yeah, and then the wizard uh, is useless because they have a high yeah. uh, spell resistance. Spe <laughs> spell resistance are, like, a really good fort save, so you can't use your insta-kill spells. Yep. Yeah, so it's like it's like just one player is useless. Each yeah, Pathfinder how... one he has a lot of that, unfortunately. Um, it, it's one of those reasons that like having now played for a couple years of one, I did. In fact, I realize now that's probably why I hated that one dungeon. That one dungeon, I remember. The do you remember? Me, like, I was dungeon? almost wanting to quit. Yeah, the assassin. Dungeon. Yeah, that I one was really bad for your character. <laughs> it, it, like, I feel like I did nothing. I was frustrated the whole time. Yeah. Would you say Carrion Crown was a dark adventure? Ooh. I would say kind of, but it's it, it's a little nonsensical, especially because they don't connect anything. Very Carrion well. Crown is the 1930s horror movies, like yeah. Dracula and Frankenstein. It's like slightly That's what it dark. Is. It's it's mon every adventure is a different universal monster guy. But it is, like, other than being that, it's sort of like, when we look at it now, and these things, sure, these were, these were early on, they were very scary, but we have, but it's basically doing that kind of tone, and we're still not in that era, we're modern day, so we can kind of look at it and be like, oh, these are kind of silly. <laughs> it's, it's supposed to be kind of terrible, but this is kind of silly. Um, you know, I think it's that unfortunate thing that it is very, that's the problem of carrying it. Crown, uh, I mean, I, I, I argue it's the worst Pathfinder adventure. I don't know because there's some that I haven't thought about. There are a lot of them, but I, I firmly stand by that it's just very terribly made. They really are very disconnected. and um, But but it, I think it's supposed to also be a darker kind of game. It's just like, it's... Unfortunately, I think that one goes in a little bit the direction of it's supposed to be darker, but a lot of the ways these things are presented are incredibly silly. It's a little campy. It, it, this is the later movies in the Pirates of the Caribbean series, you know, where it still should theoretically have that darker tone, but they've kind of mellowed out a lot of very silly things. Um, I, I think that's kind of where we put Carrying the Crown. Also, I, I will say, you can absolutely run a darker game and not put any lightness in it and like your players will just fill that in yeah you can rely on your players for that too i I've, i some players will absolutely do various silly things if they want to and that's fine and they should they should be encouraged to be silly yeah. and and that's i think a big part is that you use like if you want to include some comic relief allow your players to create a really dumb idea and then make it work and then make yeah. it like the weirdest thing possible. Like make it work, but make it work in a way that shouldn't work. <laughs> yeah, I, and I that's think, usually a good way to add comedy in. I think that's the thing is, it should be not just you trying to add in the levity. You should present situations that allow your players to add levity or have levity in the situation. It's sort of like yes, it it doesn't have to necessarily be an incredibly silly thing you're presenting. Just give a circumstance 
and you know letting your like as you said letting your players run with it people will do stupid silly stuff very Absolutely. often yeah they default to that <laughs> when i, I was mean, in uh, curse of for, for example mm -hmm. The, cur the Curse of Strahd when I ran up and bluffed the guy with a two bluff when, and then he rolled a one. <laughs> when I was a player in a what Curse of Strahd spring? game that was very you by the book, Richard. not much comedy, mm -hmm. uh, we had a bard oh. at the start of the game. That bard didn't live very long because that bard uh, made <laughs> did, a, did, a, did a spell and made it sound like, like Strahd with the big fat fart and he was Probably executed for it. But it was very funny. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's sort of like time and place for some of these things like but that. But yeah, too. like, I mean, I have a lot of issues with Curse of Straw, but that's just my personal experience with it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. Sorry, am I, am I still jittery? I think you're fine. It's okay. a little better, but I'm, I'm seeing a little bit of it still. It had Discord. It's Discord because, like, I'm fine Ooh. on my end. Yeah, so it's Discord. It's probably just it's probably dumb. Discord today. Yeah, it's um, fine. It probably is. Um, yeah, no, it's it's so, it's just. Go ahead. Oh no, I'll I'll let you go first. It's having that trying for the like you know it, it, it's it's the fine balance in a lot of things. And, mm -hmm. and I think this applies not only to you as a, as, a, as a GM or someone running a game. I think this is something that you can say to players, too, is if you want to add in a little bit of that level of levity and do some interesting things, that is fine. If you want your character to just be, like, you know, a little bit eccentric in certain ways, people have eccentricities to them. But remember, keep it as, like, a person would do. You could be, like, bolsterous and overconfident it's just like you know that's your character just you know keep it within what human you know mm -hmm. what reality would say for being a bolsterous overconfident person you know you the, everybody even if they're bolsterous and overconfident isn't an idiot and doesn't do something really stupid you might do some play. stupid things but you will but like when you're confronted with something that you're like ah yeah no you know people do say that you know <laughs> Also, in a darker game, it can also be a little too light, and you really need to do something to remind players it's a darker game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's a big part of character creation. Be like, hey, this is a darker game. Yeah. Don't make a character. Don't who, make Bozo uh, the Clown. Was... Yeah. <laughs> Bozo the Clown. Bingo the Goblin. Oh. Don't make him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to be fair, though, having like a semi-serious character who can often be the comedy release isn't bad as long as not every player is there, there's one character i'm good at and i'm very good at playing the straight man <laughs> uh, Tantus, if you know this you know tantas gets stop. it it doesn't stop it doesn't stop no, I'm, it just, I'm just it really didn't help for that that one like <laughs> three just... session game there's just there's certain games that are just like that it's been there and it's been good to have you as the person to bounce off of them but they're just when I, when I do play a, a silly character, though, I, I do play it very silly, like Gib the Kobold. The, the, the detective Kobold who was married to crime fighting. <laughs> and he just kept acquiring various hats <laughs> through those, like, four sessions. I really yeah, I, I, I have a few personality types I really like to play. Um, but I always, I usually try to do something new. I mean, like... Uh, like uh, in Joe's game, I'm currently playing a really naive character who's also mm -hmm. very like passionate about things. He's think, very naive, but also very passionate. Because of the group I tend to play with, I often fall into the category of, well, I guess I have to be the party's parent today. <laughs> and that didn't really happen that much in terms of including which I'm thankful for because people mostly made rational decisions. Yes, thankfully, I actually am happy about that because I I can sometimes fall into that one yeah. too. Sign um, another through skull and shackles. I when I played my guns, I really had to talk people of some really poor decision making. <laughs> oh my! Uh. I, actually, I was one hundred percent the parent in uh, uh, the records of evil game oh my god yes you were you were the parent for the <laughs> longest time uh just because 
I'm sorry. They did, they did, they, they did stuff. But we needed someone else. Yeah. It, 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 Records of Evil should have been. It, it didn't need to be like necessarily the most serious of games. It wasn't supposed to be. It was a, it was a, it was a weird concept uh, to begin with. It was you know time traveling evil cult. You know that was the that was the uh, you know concept. But you know you were still a horrible evil cult. You know so two people were not evil. This is what I got the gist of. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, yes, I was. I was actually evil, and then the other two were like chaotic neutral. <laughs> yes, uh, one, one was chaotic neutral, and the other I think was lawful neutral. Because recall... you're supposed to be a lawful evil cult, you know. <laughs> I, I think I, yeah. I don't remember because I, I I don't remember a lot about being in that game aside from how it ended because I have a terrible memory in my my decrepit old age of thirty. Um, you showed up and basically helped. Them I showed up, did some stuff, two. and was like. I, I just think I remember the, was it Jinx's character was like, man, that's a little too evil. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Also, I do want to say, I found it funny because like you, you said like, oh, the, the game I'm going to run next. I know you're going to run an adventure, not an adventure path, but an adventure. And then you're like, oh, it's going to have a dark tone. And I'm like, you know, based on these titles, I, I'm like, oh, maybe I could figure out, mean out which one it is. Based on these titles, I cannot. <laughs> like, <laughs> I might like join the that. Night of the Grey Death, Pray for Death, nice. uh, oh, Shadows uh, at Sundown, The no, Enmity my, my, Cycle. My sec my, the second edition I'm going to run is not based on an adventure. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this was, some of the, some of the adventures are very silly. I basically had, I, I took an old world setting that I have had, so part of a world I setting. I think I know and, this setting. Yes, uh, I, I'll, just, I'll just say it now. Um, I This is a prequel to the Adventure of Madness in the Land kind of world setting. Oh, So this is set in the world beforehand. Um, yeah, it's a army, an enemy army has not only destroyed nine other of the ten kingdoms on your continent, you're nice. the last one. But it has cursed them with horrible magic so that they're nearly inhospitable to anybody to ever Hell come yeah. back to them. So hey, I've read that book. You, That's you're basically Warhammer, baby. Yeah. You're you're at the chaos. you're at the edge. You're at the edge of it. Uh there's an army bearing down on you. When will they show up? You know, I think, I think that's how they ended Warhammer Fantasy originally. Yeah. Except the um, rat people. Yeah. Um It's not impossible to survive or anything, but you're your characters are basically going to be involved with it, not trying to necessarily run away right now to start out with. You know, you wanna you wanna help out and save some people or get revenge, you know, depending on your backstory. Um, you have and, reason. And this of the lands is the one where like a town got sucked into another dimension, nice. right? Yes. That that's what it was? Yeah, okay. Yeah. I, I remember that one. I just uh Whether or not you end up in that final location yeah. for that kind of thing to happen. But I don't know how that's going to end. I, I don't think we're going to get that far in the adventure. That's not your part about this. Maybe your character problem. would yep. or not. Um, you're dealing with the everything that's happening before that. Um, and I, I thought it was interesting okay. because I had some writings on that on this setting and kind of taking an adventure here I thought would be very interesting because, you know, by the time you're getting to madness, you know, the existential threat of the army bearing down on you is gone and you're just into that kind of interesting and wonder and exploration. You know, it's a different kind of tone. But there, it's like, I didn't really establish the, there's horrible death bearing down on you, and all of a sudden you're, like, not dealing with that. And it's like, what kind of feeling would that be? What was the world beforehand? I just kind of skipped over that. I made notes about it, so people would know stuff about it, but I didn't really dive into it. That's why I think it's interesting to take this stuff I've already yeah. had and do something with it. Yep. It just read a few no, I, I, I. Yeah, I just my thought was because you originally did say uh, that you were probably going to run a, an adventure rather than an adventure path next. Uh, yeah, that's what I, I was going to. But I was thinking about doing that, but I I, I put that mm -hmm. kind of on the side burner, you know. Um, so I probably yeah. revisit cool. that too. Well, maybe I'll do that then. Um, <laughs> I still want to run a two-week game. Um, actually, that's probably a good idea. I really should just do that and then run it and then actually like make uh, a stream content. That's RPGs, which I really want to do again. Um, uh, but yeah, so you know, I'm I'm gonna be exploring some interesting things with that. Uh, I'm I'm finishing up my um, my uh, I guess player's guide, as I can call it, mm. just putting my notes together in one Lord. spot. 
Yeah. Just the, the things the I should make, but I'm like often just kind of lazy. It, well, it's kind of like it's this interesting thing of like I really have to make notes about like what's going on with the whether or not like which ancestors you could play, which ones you know where would they be at if you could play them, and most of the mm-hmm. ancestors in second edition right now are pretty fine to use. That's why yeah. I was like, where would they be? You know. Unfortunately, most ancestries, your country's been destroyed, most of your people have been slaughtered, and you're probably a refugee at this point in time. Uh, you know, so, uh, hey, nice. you know? <laughs> I think, at least for me, the group I tend to run with, there have been enough of my games, so now I tend to run a little bit of a darker and more difficult game. Yeah. Uh, so I don't tend to need to bring, like, a big player guide. I just give a little lore primer, and that's usually it. Yeah. I, I think it's also my, my. I was gonna say, yeah, my settings tend to be a bit more neutral. I tend not to be like super light or super dark. It tends to be on where you are on my planet. <laughs> I I do think it's sort of like for me, this also helps because this is like something that I had put together some writing for, and it's extra notes for that. You know, it's putting together some actual little bits of lore and information that you know maybe. You know, years in the future, if I ever want to actually like, do something or like, publish something with this, I have more notes, you know? Um, hey. So I think it's a good idea mm-hmm. to continue. Um, and I'm bringing it back to I wrote all this stuff originally for Pathfinder as a system, and 2E is at least close enough to that, so hey. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not jumping from Pathfinder 1E to 5th edition, which is what I tried to do for Madness and Land. Which That's usually count. pretty rough. There's not yeah. really a lot of equivalency there. Yeah. Um, hey, yeah, you, no. I'm Did going you from finish the... No, it died because there were so many issues with it. Really? Mm. It a lot sometimes. of It could be a good follow-up to actually <laughs> run it Again, right. Again, well, the thing is, I've, I've thought about running it right, but I, I want to rewrite stuff the way I do it. It's basically kind of like... Uh, I think some people have talked to me about like taking the story post-madness, but I'm like, I don't know what that would be. You know, I wanted to use Madness because I knew where direction would go to, and I could use that to kind of shape where, if I wanted to do more using the setting, where it would go, kind of thing like that. You know, it's you want to finish the writing for one before you write to the next one, and I didn't have great ideas on how I necessarily want to do that. It's, it's a mess, but I probably would want to run things very differently than I did the first time if I used the concepts behind it of, you know, where we were and going through the other world and stuff I definitely would probably have you start already in the other world anyway, and, you know, just kind of prequel establish what kind of happened and stuff like that. And that can be part of the character's backstory is where you're getting into the start of this early on adventures in this uh, new world. Yeah. Yeah, well, it'll be interesting. Um, yeah. yeah. But yeah, as far as darker goes, it, it really is. I honestly think it's just more about letting, like, basically allowing the players to occasionally get away with the mm-hmm. really silly plan, is one of, one of my I think the best way. Um, yeah. My my you know, go-to like, uh, is um, I will usually reach into my bag of tricks and pull out a little talking skeleton man and dangle it in front of the party, because I just find immortal undead that are sentient kind of inherently funny. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's why that's why the Necrons are kind of amusing. They're very silly. <laughs> and then you realize that uh, their weapons literally tear you apart atom by atom, and you feel all of that pain. Yeah. Yeah. It's but it. um. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Um. There's also just introducing the silly character, or, the, or like the series, or or. The character, it's like, okay, well, I need you to go to this other job to get this person off my hair, or and like that person is silly, you know. So like sometimes it's a more of the comic relief character, sometimes it's more of the player allowing the players to get away with the silly thing once in a while. Here's Bingo the Goblin. If you make him too silly in this game, I will shoot him in front of you and make you bury his corpse. <laughs> Again, like, it's, it's presenting, like, also, like, hey, here's an NPC that tends to be a little eccentric and a little funny, you know, that maybe you have some strange interactions with. 
they could be a very serious character, but they are very kind of like presented as kind of like maybe a little low key, yeah, or yeah. something. E Eccentricities do help with that tone shift. Where it's like, yeah, this guy's this guy has some serious goals. He's got some serious things, but like you walk in on him like. You know, you, you walk in on him like naked, smoking a pipe on his roof because he's just like, I prefer doing it this way. <laughs> you know, it's Look, like, man, sometimes when your players get a little too lighthearted, you got to execute their favorite NPC in front of them. Yeah. Yes. Agreed. Yep. The most extreme way possible. They explode. Yep. They got to scar them. Got to scar them. Um, all right, why don't, we, why, don't we, why don't we move on, though, to our weekend gaming to finish up? Did anybody do anything on Sunday? No. I did not do anything on Sunday. You know, we've got Joe's game this week, so we can do it later. Um, how about a Monday? I did a Monday thing. Ooh, I'm in a ooh. Fallout game now. Speaking well, of right. the darker oh, we, 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 settings we, 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 that are a little bit lighthearted. Yeah. Um, we did our first session of the Fallout game. We're like the freak squad. Because we've got a ghoul, a super mutant, and an assault tron as, as the characters. So we're kind of like the... I don't know why people let us into cities and settlements. <laughs> Especially the, the, the robot. Just, you know, with the face laser, it's kind of messed up. Yeah, that's, that is some of those things. It's like, well, assault trons are kind of very, very a little murderous. Bit and this one likes to screw up communism. Damn you, um, but yeah, we're like we have to deal with a super mutant threat, which is kind of funny that we have a super mutant. But I guess he's a smart one. He's like Fox, I guess, from from three. He's the nice super mutant. But uh, speaking of, of settings that are dark, um, we found like a rate. We 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 had to go capture a radio tower to, to to listen to some transmissions, and there were some ragers there. Along the way, we found a guy crushing some rubble, and then. Yeah, he he wasn't going anywhere, but but people were making some lighthearted jokes about how and they were trying to save him. And I I felt the need to remind people it, it's Fallout, so I just walked over and shot him in the head. <laughs> yep. Just making too much noise. He's got shit I need. Yep. You, you are an apocalyptic wasteland with horrible monstrosities around. But he's also a raider, so he deserved. It. Oh, definitely. Uh, then we just fought super mutants, and that was the session. Fall Combat's a little bit clunky, but it is also a Modifia's game, so that is to be expected. Yeah. It's not bad. It just needs some. Yeah, well, it's sufficient. It's sufficient. Um, yeah. They are mostly skill based games, not really for combat every session. Yeah. Unless you're playing Ops on Cthulhu, which I think has a pretty good. I like it's a very different system, I imagine. Yeah. That was a Monday. Uh, we had a game on Tuesday. You, you, you fought a thing. You did fight a thing. Um, fought an awful creature. Yeah. We made some plans. We made some plans. We were trying to organize a bunch of people to attack a tower. You yeah. know, it was... I, I, you know... There was a lot of people arguing about some things. And I was there like, was yep. a lot of... There was a lot of argument over planning. Which tends to happen. I just let them do their thing. I'm not going to lie. A decent enough plan was made. Yeah. Got most of the help. Um, you got to talk to one more group, but that's not going to take that long. And then you get to go assault a, a big ancient tower that for some reason this cult wants access to. Yeah, the jerks. They're evil. They're doing evil things. They are doing evil things. We should really just not evil out. things. Evil cult. How how original. Another evil cult. We got a stab in the face. Um, uh, well, it's true. It's a Tuesday. Stabbing an evil cult in the face. That's uh, basically what the game is, really. Occasionally, yeah. a mind flare. Occasional mind. <laughs> Occasional mind flare shows up. That that just sounds like a like a like a, a really weird sitcom. So I had to be like, hey guys, don't compare me to Baldur's Gate 3, because I'm using Mind Flayers. Uh, Sorry, I can't write a get that good of a story. You get my schlop. Well, Crimson Queen finished up this week. Yep. That was <laughs> I mean, a pretty fun fight. Yeah. 
Honestly speaking. Honestly, yes. I was actually <laughs> happy with that. I think the build-up to, to the fight could have definitely been handled a lot better. But, like, again, it's the last book in a Paizo adventure, so I don't expect much. It's like the first part isn't bad. It's like you fight the dragon, you get some information. Uh, there, there technically was a possible another encounter I could have done, but it kind of was stupid <clears> and out there. Um, I skipped out on, apparently, like, a... Um, there was a side, like, another little side thing of a genie disguises as, like, a hero of the people and convince a lot of people to riot. And Why? They, uh, <laughs> well, is there a reason given, or is it just there? I, I didn't dive into it as much. There, I think there was a stupid reason. Um, I mean, I was, like, I'm gonna be real, there's a lot of... That last book has a lot of stupid reasons in it. <laughs> it really, it was, like, it was supposed to be, like, the rebellion was like, hey, God, these people, these, this, this... They didn't know it was genie. They knew it was just like, mm -hmm. this person, like a hero of the people, who's trying to like lead people in rebellion. It's like, hey, these people are just reading common rabble, and they're gonna get slaughtered. You gotta stop this. It's also it's like pissing off the locals, and might they might crack down, making it harder for us to like you know do our thing. You know, they're they're not a trained military group like us. You gotta have them shut up, <laughs> you know that kind of thing. Um, so it, it it was interesting kind of concept. But uh, I was like, no. And then, like, it is very weird that you you have this entire, like, dungeon you sort of do but don't do to get to, like, a climactic fight that doesn't happen because it's another location where there's another dungeon. Yeah, you know? it's, it's weird. I think it definitely... I, I get why it's broken up, because the queen fight is on paper quite difficult because it is a bunch of bards, and that's just kind of frustrating. Yeah. But, like, I don't know, you could just, like, cut down on some of the fights and just had it be in the throne room. Instead of some cave. Because cause you can move that artifact. It has a weight. I looked it up. <laughs> you can move it. I mean, I guess she didn't want it, like, where everybody would notice the horrible blood or... <laughs> just have her do it in the basement or something. It's a giant blood orb. Um... Uh... That theoretically is a basement, but I don't know if they, like, spat out most of that, it's like, room kinda, below. It's kind of dumb. I don't know. It's handled very weirdly. It, 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 it's broken up for kind of no reason. I'm not going to lie. Like, my experience with, um, at least, because I've gotten to three finale, finales of books. Strangely enough. They do this a lot. They, they do this a lot. That's what run, Britain won. Carrying crowd. Doesn't surprise me. I, <laughs> it doesn't surprise that the last book of Carrying Crown is actually good because you got to go through so much garbage to get to it. Yeah, it's you attack a stronghold of the Whispering Way, you defeat its people, um, and then uh, you rescue the guy that you're trying to rescue, and you find out that he was going to be shipped off to the big tower in mm -hmm. where Grace Fire or whatever Tire. it's called. Yeah. And the, the, the big boss is hanging out there, you know. It's like... Cause... He's basically attack this for 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 fortress to save the guy. Oh, hey, mm -hmm. we did. We should finish the job. Go and go fight the final guy. Because Skull, Which... Skull and Shackles did this, and we just skipped it because it's like... It's just dudes. It's just it's just men with swords. When just, like, not interesting or fun. It's like, it, for reasons you re lead a rebellion at the end of Skull and Shackles... It really is very reasons you run the it rebellion. It kind of, like... like... I get it, but it kind of comes out of nowhere. Like, Bone Fist, he was an asshole, he but he wasn't that, like... No, he... It's like, bad. that kind of comes out of nowhere. Yeah, and then you fight through not one dungeon, but two to get to it. Because there's the above ground, and then, like, the hidden underground you, know you when fight I, through. I get a little more, because it is, again, just... Most of the AP is just guys with swords, and yeah. they're not particularly strong. Yeah. But, I mean, like, the dungeon itself isn't, I think, bad. It's just the why your hell you're doing that. Yeah, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. It doesn't make a lot of sense like that. Like, the, the double dungeon for that one, at least it's like you you fight through the one thing, you're like, ah, he's escaped to this underground where his ship is. We've got to stop him before he sails away, kind of thing, you know, like uh, that. Kind of chase him down. Um, it's, it's not bad, but yeah. It's just, no. It's, I, I think Crimson Queen had a, lot, had a bunch of issues. It definitely feels like early. I think it's... Oof. More in, it, well, aside from Scarwall, it was more enjoyable than most of Skull and Shackle because Skull and Shackle had a lot of really annoying stuff in it for like the entire campaign. Yeah, 
they, they tr I feel like they tried for a lot more weird mechanics. Not that you didn't have some weird mechanics here, mm -hmm. um, but like also I'm like they did technically. I, I don't even really look into it. They kind of had a rebellion system to a degree, where it's just like if you have to do a certain things, it depends on like the final outcome of the rebellion. And like, I was speaking, you did all the things anyway, so I'm like, oh, you know, yeah, you made good plans, you know. I'm not paying attention to this or something for this. It's just me. Uh, yeah. I think I think one more. Can we do anything on a Thursday? Go ahead. I was, I was just about to comment. It's like, that is one thing I learned about Pathfinder. It's like, uh, they, they like to add new, like, add new, uh, Pathfinder Adventure Pass, like to add new mechanics when just <sighs> using a normal mechanic would work. Yeah, they like to have, here's this cool uh, meta mechanic, but also we kind of half baked it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it, if they. There's a way they could do it to where it's like they have one good mechanic that they use for everything. And it'd probably be fine. Yeah. I don't think it's necessarily a bad idea, but if they actually designed a lot of these a little bit better, I think it would make it okay. You know, it's like sort of like a lot of these, as you said, are half-baked. And if they were at least a little bit better designed, I think I wouldn't mind it as much that they're trying to like add in interesting systems because there are uses for some of these things in other games and stuff like that. But they feel like they need a little bit more yeah. something. Some of them are fine. Some of them are just like, this is a level of complication that's too much. And some of them are just like, this is it's not fun to engage with because it's like half a mechanic. Yeah. Like, I had to rewrite the race mechanic for that race section because it was so, like, not there. Or, like, like us um, looking at, like, the fucking mass... Naval mass, battle rules. Mass naval battles are really bad. Ugh. Mass battles is bad in everything, though. Uh, like, um, Hell's Rebels has a whole entire, like, day has passed, you get rebellion actions thing. That's a level too complicated. I, I, anything Thursday or Friday? I, 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 uh, Thursday, I played with Plastic at a friend's house. We did some Warhammer. Ooh, nice. Um... I don't have my armies anymore. I sold them to afford food, um, mm. but I did play. We he has a he's a big Warhammer. He's a bunch of armies. It was my first time playing an edition of Warhammer that's new. Tenth edition's pretty fun. Um, I played Necrons because they're my favorite boys. I love them. They're little skeleton jerks and they're cool. Um, mm. It was just like we did a couple battles. We're a little relaxed on rules, and there were a bunch of us, and we were, like, doing multiple tables. And, and you're not supposed to do this. This isn't in the rules. You can't interfere with other people's battles. But like, ah, fuck it. We're all, we're all on the same planet. So someone who had, like, these big missiles, I'll just, like, I don't know. I'll just launch them on that table. <laughs> That's actually fun. Um... I mean, like, if you, if you agree to account for that, I, should, I don't mind. We all agree to it. I should note, these missile launchers are very... In in universe, very stupid. In game, they have an infinite range, which is dumb, by the way. Um, but in universe, if you fire one of these uh, without like permission, you are on the spot executed for treason because they're that devastating. Oh. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Just... Right, uh, it was fun. Yeah. Death edition's pretty good. Um. I read some of the new codexes, the Custodes Codex. I, I feel bad for anyone who plays them because, God, they're shit now when they're really good in 8th edition. Mm. Sucks to suck back them. to the Stone Age. Yeah. It's like, these guys are cool. We're going to nerf them. Yep. Sorry if you like playing them. Uh, good luck. Oof. Well, sounds like a good week in tabletop. Um... Thank you for joining us! Uh, thank you, Momo, for popping in there uh, for our deeper discussion topic. Um, it was a good one. Uh, thank you, Worm. I actually that was a very good discussion topic. I thought we had a lot to say, and it was kind of fun meandering oh, yeah. in a way that stayed slightly on topic for once. Yeah. <laughs> well, sometimes it happens. You know, it's like, I, 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 I thought of the topic when we were while I was uh, doing it. Because I'm like, you know, this is something I've been thinking about. Because I'm like, Having been watching a few more, you know, TTRPG shows, certainly speaking, you know, especially because I've been watching Tales of the Dragon. Good one. They're, pre they're pretty comical. But, like, I've I, I, starting going back to Adventure 1, 
he's very comical. And then thinking about adventure two, like their second um, adventure campaign, that is a pretty dark campaign that they add a lot of levity yeah, to this yeah. over time. And so I was thinking about it, I'm like, that's what caught me in mind. I don't think I need that level of levity, but it does make me think of like, you do need something sometimes to caught, catch like the level of darkness you can have. Yeah, I, I listen to a lot of uh, narrative declaration, um, which tend to do a little more serious um pathfinder games or, or they're doing warhammer now and uh they t it's a good balance because the players are, are very silly people uh they, they they were doing kingmaker and there's a bit where you find the iconic barbarian um lady unconscious and one of the players like she's our competition what if we just slit her throat right now and the guy would be like whoa hold on dude we need allies they'll do that I think the DM for that game works for Paizo as well, so that's kind of funny. Alright, um... We can leave it there today, though. So, um... Yeah, thank you, too. Um, um uh, where, Momo, the, 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 Momo, you been to your shout-out? Uh, I... Don't think I have anything to shout-out at the moment. They're not really doing anything. Uh, Worm, how about you? Yeah, I'm Diamond Worm. You can find me at twitch.tv slash Diamond Worm and Diamond Worm on Twitter. Uh, Diamond Worm on Blue Sky, Diamond Worm on, the, the Diamond Worm on YouTube. Uh, and yeah. Uh, I've been streaming a lot. And I actually counted it up, including like this plus like the Wednesday game and everything. I've been like streaming like 16 hours a week. <laughs> Uh, it's a lot for someone who also has a you know forty hour week full time job. <laughs> yep. Anyway, yeah. but I enjoy it for the most part. There have been a lot more breaks lately because work has been crazy. Oh gosh, I gave a whole rant about like I don't know what my like one of my bosses is thinking because he just like he's like I think we should set up a confidentiality policy. And then he presented us with this draconian nightmare that nice. like, is we sell your soul. And I'm like, I talked with my other coworker and we're like, yeah, we're not signing this. I don't think that'll do anything. It's a small company. So we can actually like say, yeah, no to them um, without getting fired. Uh, but I'd rather quit than sign this thing. It's that bad. In the yeah, it's bad enough to where if I signed it, they would technically own all my YouTube and Twitch content. Nice. Wow. <laughs> That's how bad it is. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. Um, it, yeah. It's crazy. It, it actually claims work of works of authorship while at while during working hours or not. As I think that's that kind like of, pretty not okay. Yeah. There's some other yeah. It's basically hey, Disney levels of bad. Friends, this is why you always read every contract. Mm -hmm. Yes. Especially if it's like un, like yeah, especially for things like work and, you know, mm -hmm. business and stuff. You want to read an employee... Con like, I read my employee's handbook when I originally did it, and, like, that was fine. It was very much like, yeah. uh, you know, like... <laughs> but this is like, you are not allowed to say anything about anything you do here for five years. And I'm like, this is unnecessary for what we do. <laughs> like, I do not know why my uh, one of my bosses was, like, presented this thing. And I'm just like... Okay, now I have to figure out how to respond to this, so I'm st I, I haven't uh, responded yet. <laughs> I work in healthcare, so I have to deal with a lot of I can't say certain things that happen at work. I'm a healthcare cook, and I have a lot of access to certain personal information of residents that cannot be shared. Uh, yeah, and, and like that kind of stuff makes sense, but it's just like the I own all I own I own you <laughs> That's contract wild. is weird for a company with like seven people That's at it. It's a little weird. Uh, like I do not know what my boss was thinking. Well, I'll give my shout out and we'll end for today. Path to Average Coven. Uh check me out my social media is over on uh Discord Career slash X. I got Blue Sky finally up and running. I do have to finish that little bit. But I got it up and running at least. Woo. And then um I, I got my YouTube. You can check out all everything that's tabletop goes up over there. Schedules usually put up on the beginning of the week. Um yeah. 
I think that's about all the things I can shout out. Remember to do all the various things on the YouTube channel. So keep the various algorithms, wherever you're hanging out. And, uh, um, yeah. Again, thank you to my two co-hosts for joining me. I think we're all going to get going. Uh, I apparently have to... I've been texted about, like, you know, uh, getting dinner, and I'm apparently picking it up, because I'm the only other person who picks up dinner. <laughs> oh, fine. Rip. So, hey, my quest to go out in the world is the beginning. Anyway, bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>